Previously, we discussed how all ideas can be traced back to impressions and thus impressions take precedence over ideas. And also all the ideas in our imagination first were given as impressions. This discovery alone has made a large contribution to many debates regarding our ideas. All our impressions are vividly clear, but often our ideas are obscure. We will apply this principle to our ideas of space and time. To explain how we develop the idea of extension, Hume has us conduct a demonstration. We see with our eyes open many things around us, and we then close our eyes and consider the distances between these things, these objects that we just saw. By means of this impression, we obtain the idea of extension. So there are two possible kinds of impressions that can lead to the idea of extension. First, visual impressions, or second, internal impressions arising from signed impressions, such as passion, emotions, desires, or aversions. We would like to determine more specifically what sorts of internal impressions may give rise to the notion of space. It does not seem that our passions, emotions, desires, or aversions could possibly lead to our notion of space. The only other possibility for the source of the idea of space is the senses. Our principal question is now, what sort of sensory impression produces the notion of space? Hume makes us imagine a table. We see its spatial extent, hence this image alone suffices to endow us with the idea of extension. So in this case, an impression appears to the senses. Then we borrow from the impression the idea of its extension. And this borrowed idea now represents the impression of the table's extension. However, our senses did not convey to us geometric lines, rather they only gave us the impression of colored points that are found before us in a certain manner. Hume thinks we see no more than precisely what we see. Now imagine that the table we have seen is purple. That means every time the idea repeats, it will not only retain the extensive proportions but also the color purple. Then we see many other objects of a whole variety of colors and shapes. On the one hand, when we see purple objects, no matter their shape, we have a tendency perhaps to recall the purple table. But on the other hand, we also see objects of different colors sharing similar proportions to the purple table. In those cases, despite the color differences, we will still have the tendency to recall the purple table. Hence, in this way, we regard extension as distinct from color. But there is never an abstract or general idea that is like a category for extension. However, when we hear the word purple, our minds will tend to recall any of the purple objects, no matter their form. This is because we have developed the habit of associating this word with any of those impressions. Our great variety of impressions, of reflections and impressions of sensations are given to us in succession. From this succession, we obtain the idea of time. Every visual impression will lend to our idea of space, but any impression whatsoever will contribute to our idea of time. Any specific impression will cause us to tend towards recalling those in succession with it. Hence, our idea of time is represented by some particular individual idea. To have the idea of time, we must have the tendency of recalling other successive impressions and ideas. But this means we must first have some impression or idea that evokes that association. Hence, it is not possible for time alone ever to make its appearance or be taken notice of by the mind. Someone sleeping is having no succession of thoughts, so he has no sense of time. Or someone occupied with just one thought is insensible of time as well. Now, if someone has many different thoughts, rapidly succeed one another in a given duration, then time will seem to move quickly for him. But if in that same duration he has only a few impressions succeeding each other, then time will seem slower for him. Locke even says that we have limits to how fast or how slow we may receive impressions. Consider when in the darkness we take a red hot coal and swing it around in circles. We no longer see the coal, rather we see a red circle. This is because the ember is moving faster than we are able to have impressions of it. So we sense motion whenever something moves faster than our ability to have successive impressions of it. And whenever we have no successive impressions, we as well have no sense of time even though there is a succession continuing in the world around us. Thus. 
Time cannot make its appearance to the mind, either alone or attended with a steady, unchangeable object, but is always discovered by some perceivable succession of changeable objects. Hume will now offer an argument to make the above point absolutely convincing. He says that we perceive longer and shorter durations, thus we know that time consists of parts. Also, we distinguish duration from extension. We do so by means of a distinguishing quality. What distinguishes extension is that its parts coexist. Hence, we know that durations as parts do not coexist. Thus, time is composed of non-coexisting parts. Now, if we saw an object that does not change, then it will never produce a different impression. Hence, we will not perceive a succession. Instead, all our impressions of it will coexist. For we do not sense them succeeding one another. Thus, an unchanging object will not give us the idea of time. Rather, we may only obtain the idea of time from a succession of changing objects. And when time first appears to us, it cannot be severed from the changing succession that brings it out. So we know now that when time first appears to us, it is conjoined with a succession of changing objects. And, the, and when there is not a succession of changing objects, we will not notice time. Now we ask, is it possible to conceive time without also conceiving a succession of objects? And are successions the only way we may form a distinct idea of time? So we want to know if we can have the idea of time distinct from the successive impressions that first produce our sense of duration. We know that when things are different, they are distinguishable, and all distinguishable things may be separated. For if things are different, they may be conceived apart, but if things are not different, then they are not distinguishable, and if they are not distinguishable, they cannot be separated. Imagine that you hear a flute play five notes. You perceive the notes, and by means of their succession, you perceive time. But you do not thereby have six impressions five notes and one time impression. And when we reflect on our impressions of these notes, we will also obtain a notion of time. Yet still, we do not thereby obtain it as an additional impression. But we need such an additional emotion or affection in order to produce the extra impression of time. Our minds notice just the manner that the impressions succeeded each other. This way, it may associate it with other successions. We said above, that things which cannot be separated or distinguished are no different. Hence, there is no difference between the successions and our idea of time. Thus also, we can only conceive time when there are objects. Time cannot be conceived by itself, for it does not appear as a primary distinct impression. It is no more than different ideas, impressions, or objects related in a certain manner, that is, by succession. We have discussed our ideas of space and time. We derive these ideas from our impressions, we found that a doctrine regarding the ideas of space and time is that they are not distinguishable from their proper impressions. And this doctrine is established by another very decisive argument, which is based on this principle that our ideas of space and time are compounded of parts which are indivisible. Hume will now examine that argument. He says that extended things have parts, so the idea of extension has parts. That is to say, it is a compound idea made up of simple ideas. But none of extension's simple ideas themselves have any, any parts. So no one of extension's simple ideas by itself qualifies as an idea of extension. We also know that the compound idea of extension is a real idea, so it cannot be made up of ideas that are nothing. Also, we know that extension's simple ideas are not themselves ideas of extension, but they also cannot be nothing either. These simple ideas must be of indivisible units, otherwise we would obtain Zeno's paradoxes. So Hume wonders, what is our idea of a simple and indivisible point? We are not asking a mathematical question about the nature of mathematical points, rather we are wondering about the nature of their ideas. No one has considered this question yet, so Hume's answer will seem somewhat new. Things that are neither visible nor tangible do not appear extended to us. So we obtain the idea of space by means of two senses, sight and touch. We know that extensions are made of parts. Also, the compound sense impressions that give us objects as extensivity is also made of parts. These lesser impressions are indivisible to the eye or tactile feeling. These indivisible impressions are of atoms endowed with color and solidity. 
and we must preserve the idea of their color or tangibility in order for our imagination to comprehend them and if we remove the ideas of these sensible qualities they are utterly annihilated to the thought or imagination if something holds for the parts then it holds for the whole as well now we have sensible impressions of an extended objects indivisible parts if our impressions of the parts do not give us impressions of their color or tangibility then they will not convey any ideas to us and our idea of extension is composed of these points so if the parts give us no ideas then we cannot have an idea of extension however we do have an idea of extension thus its parts must exist so these must be colored and tangible we have therefore no idea of space or extension but when we regard it as an object either of our sight or feeling so the indivisible parts of extension must be filled with some real object or existence we will find that this holds as well for time the indivisible movements in succession both forms duration and renders it mentally conceivable